Hi guys, we miss you here at church, and um, but we're excited to be able to worship with you online. Um, let's just pray and get into worship. Father God, we come before you, Lord Jesus, and we thank you, God, for this day, Lord. We thank you for your goodness, God. Even in the midst of uncertainty, God, you are certain, Lord, and you stay the same, Lord Jesus. So we come to you now, God, for you are the best ability, Father God. We pray, Lord, that you would speak to us, Lord, through this message, God, and just um, unite our hearts with you through this worship, Lord Jesus. We love you and we praise you and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
come before you again, Lord Jesus, and we thank you, Lord, that your name is above every other name, Lord, that you are more powerful, Father God, than anything in this world. Jesus, we praise you, Lord, that we can look to you, Lord, that we can trust in you, God, that you are our good shepherd, Lord, that you lead us and guide us in our way, Lord, and even if we feel weak, Father God, you become our strength, Lord, and I just pray now, Lord, that you would just soften our hearts, God, to give us ears, Lord, to hear what it is that you desire to speak to us in these crazy times, God. We're here, Lord, to listen to you speak, God, and I just pray that you would anoint Scott, Lord, that you would speak completely through him, Jesus. We love you and we praise you, and we ask these things in your name. Amen. Hey, welcome to Calvary Chapel Golden Springs, and I am Scott, the youth pastor here at Calvary, and I am stoked to be here with you guys. I am so sorry that we can't have you guys here right now and that services are temporarily suspended. But for the meantime, right now, we're going to be doing remote church. And we will be airing live on Monday evenings at 7 p.m. for the high school, junior high. And we look forward to see what God's going to do. We're going to be going through the book of 1 John tonight. But I'm, I've got a few announcements to make before we get started with the study. As you guys know, um, right now we've got a missions trip coming up. Hopefully this whole thing will be cleared up by then. We're leaving in June, halfway through June, uh, June 15th through the 30th. There's still one ticket available for anybody that wants to go on our annual missions trip to South America. We're going to Peru this year. We'll be doing some works in, in some mountain jungle villages, as well as visiting Cuzco and seeing Machu Picchu and all kinds of things like that. It's going to be a great trip. The cost is $2,100, and again, there's still one spot available for anybody that's thinking about going. Come and see me or call, and we can get you signed up for that right away. Also, our summer retreat, that's happening in July, July 19th through the 24th. We're going to be down in South, South Orange County. We're going to be having a surf camp down there. We have five wonderful days, and the theme of our retreat this year is going to be the Christ-centered life. What a great opportunity for you not only to, to refocus your relationship with Jesus Christ and, and center your relationship, but also prepare yourself, if everything goes well, that you go back to school next year and have a right setting with your walk with God. So I encourage you guys to sign up for that here at the chapel as well. And don't forget, you can follow us on the Instagram or the SoundCloud account to catch up on some of the services and the different things that are going on throughout the week. If you guys have a Bible, open up to the book of 1 John. Great book, you guys, written by the Apostle John. This book was written with a couple of purposes in mind, but one of the main purposes is he was combating some false teachings and some false doctrines that were going on during that time. Um, the book of First and Second and Third John are authored, of course, by John the Beloved, disciple of Jesus. And he is one of the four writers of the Synoptic Gospel. Synoptic means Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He's one of the writers. 
Now, um, a lot of people ask if it's the same John that wrote the Gospel of John. Of course, we know that that is. And he was an actual eyewitness of the things that Jesus said, the things that he saw, the things that he did. And so what better account do we have of, G of John himself being there with Jesus as a personal uh, witness of what went on there, you guys? And here, you guys, we're going to see, again, this is a great um, book, especially in the times that we're living in, um, when we have to combat so many different things that, that, that are against the truth. Gnosticism is just one of those religions or one of those philosophies at the time that John was dealing with, and I'll kind of explain it to you. Gnosticism was basically one of the main heresies of the second century church. And um, Gnosticism believes that the story of the creation, or basically the creation found in the Bible, was a lie, and that God wasn't actually the one responsible for the creation of the world, at least not directly. They say indirectly. They claim that the evidence of this comes from the imperfection, tragedy, and the evil that's found in the world. In other words, they look at the world and say, it's so messed up, it's so evil, it's so bad. How could a perfect, loving God have created such a terrible world? We'll, we'll get into that later. And then, and then they also believe that um, a, good, good, a good God could not have created that. And their central teaching was that, that the spirit, the spirit of man is entirely good, but everything that is physical is evil. Therefore, this, uh, this background tends to believe that, that, that God could not have created that. And so there's a lot of false teachings there. And it goes in, it directly goes in and, and combats the whole deity of Jesus Christ. If God is not the creator of all things, then everything else that he says in his word is a lie, and it slowly dismantles it. Do they believe that Jesus is the Messiah? Yes and no. There's a whole bunch of varying things on that, but we're going to talk about that a little bit later. The book of uh, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, um, a great books, but the book of 1st John, you guys, is all about fellowship with God. And I'll tell you why fellowship is so important, you guys. This is the, one of the reasons why we encourage young people to come to church, like, we see a lot of people get saved at different uh, studies at, at, uh, 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 at the school campus outreaches that we do with the whosoever's and the different events for the studies that Raw does midweek. And we always want to encourage the young people, hey, get involved in a church. Find a solid church where you can get plugged in, where we're going to teach you the word and where you're going to connect with a bunch of young people your own age. Because let's face it, you have lots of friends at your school, your work, your team, all things like that. But you need people that are going to lift you up spiritually. And that's one of the things that we try to strive for here at Calvary Chapel is that we believe in that whole iron sharpening the iron principle. In other words, it literally means if like you're making a knife, like say you're forging fire and you're checking out that stuff, and, and, and they're making a knife and you want to sharpen that knife. Well, you've got to make sure that the metal that you're using is, is harder and more denser than the metal that, you're, that you are actually trying to sharpen or else it's going to dull it. And so we believe that if you're going to become a Christian, a solid Christian, somebody that walks in truth and walks in light and walks in love, you want to, to hang around with people that have the same passion, if not greater, that are going to encourage you to become a better believer, a stronger believer. Someone's going to help you keep, uh, stay accountable. And so we believe that fi finding a good fellowship, or the word we're going to come into in a minute, or the definition of that word fellowship, koinonia, is an important thing. It means a oneness, kind of like when you're on a team or if you're on a military unit. Let's talk about the team situation. A team is made up of a bunch of different people, but when they come together, all of them have a different function of that team. But when they all come together, they play together, they move together as one, and thus they fulfill the same purpose of winning or competing as the whole team. If you have one person doing their own thing and another person doing their own thing, the team is off balance, the harmony is off, and thus the team is ineffective. And the same thing applies with the church, the body of Christ. Although we are, gonna, are not an organization, we're more of an organism. In other words, a living organism made up of different cells. I mean, you and I are each part, as Paul says, members of that body of Christ. Look at a, a military type of unit. You have uh, a bunch of different men that have different skill sets and different abilities. But again, one strategy and one particular plan, and when they come together, the ger general or the colonel or the, the commander tells each individual guys what to do, and they fulfill that purpose and that task. Well, God has a purpose and a task for the church, and this is the purpose of the church. The purpose of the church is that we would go forth and be his mouth and his hands and his eyes in this world, that we're supposed to reach our own people as we are being filled with his spirit, as we take on the character of his nature. Now, this is a regeneration process, and we're going to get into that in a moment because that's super important. John talks about that uh, in, the, in the gospel of John. It's, it's the main theme of the, of the book of John is the regeneration process. Here in this particular book in 1 John, it's all about fellowship. Now, 
One of the things I want to talk about is what is fellowship and why is it important. You heard me mention it multiple times. The word fellowship means oneness or a communion or the word is in Greek is the koinonia. Now, why is this important? Well, you've got to go all the way back to the book of Genesis to understand what this fellowship is all about and why it's so important. If you think about it, God created man to have fellowship. You're like, wait, was God lonely? Was he up there in heaven just hanging out, cloud surfing by himself? We don't know what God was doing. We don't know what, what, what he was doing at that time, but we do know this. The angels were present with him, but they're not the same as you and I. They're servants, and, and they are created servants. And, and so when he created us, the Bible says he created us in his express image. We're in his image. Now, does God have hair? Does God have eyes and ears and a nose and hands and feet? I would like to think he does, just in a different way that you and I do. Now, um, fellowship literally was began in the beginning. When he created Adam on the earth, there was perfect communion between God and man. As a matter, matter of fact, if you read the story in Genesis chapter 1 all the way through chapter 5 and 6, you see there that God had fellowship, special connection and relationship with mankind. There was nothing between them. Matter of fact, God spoke to him. God gave him a, a task, and the task was to, to watch over and to tend the garden. He named the animals, and he had a beautiful existence in the presence of God. Then God saw that he was, he was lonely. He gave him or brought to him. He created him a wife from his own flesh. And from that time after, Satan entered in and began to, to tempt Eve and Adam, and thus sin was born, and thus the separation began between God and man. Now, with that separation, you recall that God could no longer be living in the presence of man and vice versa anymore because there was sin and he had to judge the sin. So what he did was he put man out of the garden. But even from the very beginning, when he's dealing with man's sin, he asked the woman, what did you do? And, and or asked the man, what did you do? And the man said, the woman that you gave me. And then he, he asked the woman, what did you do? And she says, the serpent, he tricked me or he deceived me. And then as he, he condemns the, the, the serpent and as he, as he condemns man and, and woman being separated from the garden and out of his presence, he says something very profound. He says, from now on to the serpent, he says, on the dust or on the ground you shall go, on your belly, and you shall eat the dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between your seed and her seed, and he will crush your head, but you will bruise his heel, or vice versa. Literally what he's saying in the very beginning, he says, from now on, you are going to be at amnity or animosity with the seed of man, meaning the coming Messiah. See, Satan hates mankind, and I'll tell you why he hates mankind. People ask me all the time, did God not create men? Yes, he did. Did he create Satan? More so, he was, a, he was a, a, a created servant, but he went rogue, so to speak. But he can't have fellowship with God anymore. He comes to and fro in the presence of God, but he doesn't have the same fellowship like he once had. Being an elevated angel and worshiping before the Lord, he was cast down from the earth, as the Bible tells us, and one-third of the angels he drew with him. So his fellowship was ended with God. The last thing that he wants is somebody to have what he cannot have. He's a selfish individual. That's why you know that selfishness is always steeped in pride, which is from the enemy, the devil, and that's what caused him to fall down to earth. When he sees creature, any, any other person that is receiving the glory of God or that manifests himself and, and takes his own or what he feels is his place at the right hand of God, it infuriates him. He hates mankind. He has tried to destroy us from the very beginning. So when God told the serpent, that from now on I'm going to put enmity between your seed and her seed. He's literally saying that you're going to try to kill uh, mankind. But it sa he says, but he shall crush your head, but you will bruise his heel. In other words, Satan will try to bite the heel of man, but in the end man will crush his head and destroy him. And we know this is confirmed when Jesus came, lived, and died on the cross and then resurrected. See, Jesus died on the cross physically, but here's the thing. Satan thought he got victory. But when Jesus resurrected, he literally put his, head, his foot down and crushed the head of the serpent. And thus he took death hostage. And now death no longer has any power or any strength over any of us. Now we, like he, are going to live forever. John 3.16 is a perfect illustration. For God so loved the world. The word so, two little letters, gives you the degree of his awesome love. He loved us so much 
that he gave. The word gave is another word of saying sacrifice. He sacrificed his own son that whoever, anybody who would have put their trust in him would never perish but have eternal life. And Satan hates this. He hates this. So God has sought from the very beginning to restore the fellowship, the koinonia, that he had in the garden with mankind. And he already had it all worked out. When he said that the seed of man would basically crush the serpent's head, he knew that he was going to send his son down to be the propitiation, and we're going to cover that word later, the substitution for all of our sins and all of our, our wickedness. And by his blood, we would be washed, cleansed, and justified in God's eyes. Now, how did this happen? Well, you have God, righteous over here, and he's separated from lost man over here. And the two have no more fellowship, so he sends his son down, and he takes hold of the loving father and hold of the lost world, and he's nailed there to the cross and becomes the human bridge by which to connect the loving father and lost mankind. That's why when Jesus said there are many ways that lead to destruction, but very few people, are, are, are and, 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 and narrow is the way that leads to righteousness. But then he says, but I am the way and I am the truth and the light. And the separate verse says, I am the way, I am the truth and I am the life. And no one comes to the Father unless he comes through me. He's literally saying that he is the bridge to bring about a lost relationship with God. And it doesn't matter what you've done or how far you've gone. You can have a restored relationship with God through his son, Jesus Christ. Now, Let's get into the chapter here. Chapter 1, starting in verse 1. The first four verses are really cool. I love this first four verses because he's literally talking about... Actually, let me, let me read something else. Um, there were ten things that you're going to find in the book of 1 John that are important. There are four little, or ten, ten little assurances. Assurances mean things that you can bank on. Something that you could read and take it as truth because it's, it's purposely written in within the Word. And they're kind of like uh, uh, promises, so to speak. They're things that the reason or the purpose why he wrote this book. Ten of them. And I'm going to read one of them to you. One of them is found in 1 John uh, verse 4. So that he and the church may have joy. It says, and these things I write to you, that your joy may be full. These things I have spoken to you, that, your, that my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. He writes that in John 15, 11. They're very similar. John 15 and 1 John uh, one four. Now let me ask you if you know the difference between happiness and joy. We, we talked about this before. Happiness is conditional and it's based on conditions. If I say tomorrow we're going to the beach and you're like, yes, so excited. But then you wake up like this morning and it's cloudy, cold and rainy. I don't think we're going to the beach. We could still go, but it's going to be freezing, cold and miserable. It's not going to be like a normal hot summer day. So now your happiness is now all gone because the conditions changed the situation. Well, let's talk about another one. Let's say I write you out a check for 150 bucks, and you're like super stoked. You're already planning in your head what you're going to buy. You go to the bank. You go to cash the check, and all of a sudden they say, I'm sorry, there's something wrong with the check. And you say, no, 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 my, my youth pastor gave me the check. And you go to cash it again. He says, I'm sorry, this check's no good. There's nothing in the account. All of a sudden your happiness now turns to uh, sadness or maybe even anger because the check is no good. You see what I'm saying? So your happiness is conditional upon the things that happen. But joy is something internal. It's something eternal. And it's something spiritual. It comes from God. You can only have that joy in the Lord. And the joy that God wants us to have is, hey, no matter what happens to you in this life, no matter the things that you face, the things that you go through, remember this, that beyond this life there is eternity and you're going to spend it with me. And so you can have a joy that no matter what happens in this life, I'm good with God and he's good with me. And that is a joy. It is a peace that to know that we have an eternal resting place. It is a joy to know that all of my sins are washed away, cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. It is a joy to know that no matter where I go, no matter what I do, no matter how far I can sometimes wander, the love of God will draw me back. And the Holy Spirit will continue to, to, to transform my life and make me more into His image. And that I, I will one day be with Him in eternity. That's a beautiful promise. So the second thing we have here, you guys, is it is found in uh, verses, uh, chapter 2, verse 1. Now, I'm kind of generalizing the whole book of 1 John, but so that they would not sin. He's not saying that you're not going to ever sin. He means that you would not make a practice of sin. Because when you are a believer, the last thing you want to do is grieve the Holy Spirit. The last thing you want to do is do something that you know is going to draw any kind of sorrow or sadness or grief to the Spirit. 
Before you were a believer, you didn't care. You did whatever came natural to you. Without question, without apathy, or empathy at all. You just did what came natural. But as a believer, as his spirit now lives in you, you now begin to, to experience what we call conviction sometimes. When you think about doing wrong, or when you do wrong, or when you have done wrong, you feel that conviction like, Lord, I let you down. Lord, I disappointed you. And the last thing we want to do is do that. And it draws us. The Bible says that, that repentance basically leads us, or, or confession leads to repentance. And repentance, you guys, leads us to righteousness. We, we see that as a principle throughout the Bible. The third thing I wrote down here is, you guys, is because our sins are forgiven us. In 1 John 2, 12, I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you uh, uh, for his name's sake. The word forgiven is a different word than um, that a lot of people don't understand. Human beings don't have the ability to really forgive like God. I think there's a saying that says, to forget is human, but to, but to, for, to forgive is divine. See, human beings might forget something, but they don't know how to forgive something because we always hold a grudge. We have things in the back of our heads. Our memories won't let us forget the things that we have done and what people have done to others and vice versa. So to forgive is divine. And, and, and forgiveness literally means that what a person has done is wiped, washed, and cleared and is not brought to remembrance anymore. You know, the Bible talks about that when a man, is, his sins come before God and when a man asks God for repentance and and forgiveness that the Bible takes is, the Bible says that God takes the sin and he casts it as far as east is to west. Now think about how far that is. They're both in contrasting directions, right? East is constantly moving away from west. And then it says in another verse that he puts it in the deepest part of the sea and he remembers it no more. Now you and I remember it because we're human. And the enemy loves to bring those things that we did in the past to our mindset. It's called condemnation. If you want to know the difference between condemnation and conviction, we spoke about this before, that condemnation makes you feel like less than adequate. It makes you feel like, I don't deserve the love of God. It makes you feel like, you know, I'm, I'm a, I'm a second-rate Christian, that I'm horrible, that I'm not saved, and all these things, and it just brings you and beats you down. That's how you know it's the enemy, because God's love is constantly trying to reinforce, to build up, and to elevate. I've heard it said, and I think Chuck said this, that condemnation draws you away from God, pulls your attention away from the things of God, the promises of God, the love of God, where conviction brings you to the feet of the cross and makes you broken before God, and you want to receive from God His love and His grace and His mercy. So now you know the difference between condemnation and conviction. Conviction is a good thing. Condemnation is a bad thing. That usually comes from the devil because the Bible says that there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. So little there. Then if we have verse 3, or the number 3 thing he says, or 4 things, is that they would know that God, they would know that God is the Father. Okay, now that we know that there are three distinct um, persons of the Trinity. Now, I've heard people say, well, I've never seen the word Trinity in the Bible. How do you know that's even a doctrine? Well, it's proven. It's, it's there whether you can prove that it's a doctrine or not. I'll put it this way. Um, we can't, like when Jesus was talking to Nicodemus and he's saying, you know, um, you don't understand the spirit of God, but, but you, you do acknowledge that there's such a thing as wind. And I think all of us can acknowledge that there's wind, although we can't see the wind, can we? Can you say, oh, I saw the wind yesterday. No, you saw the effects of the wind. You saw it was a windy day because why? Because the trees were swaying. The leaves were blowing everywhere. Your hair was all messed up. You could barely get into your car. Trash was blowing around. You saw the effects of the wind. Yet we do not know, Jesus even said, yet you do not know where it comes from. Such is the Spirit of God. Well, we have three distinct persons of the Trinity. The Father, we have the Son, we have the Holy Spirit. All three are not the other, but all three are God, and all three are very distinct. Much like water in its liquid state is water. If it's frozen in its frozen state, we call it ice. And in its gas state, if you were dissipated into, and to have it, you know, uh, evaporate, you would see steam, that's water in a gas form. But water in a gas form, steam, or ice, or liquid, are all three the same thing, water, but just in different forms. And that's how I like to use the illustration to kind of explain God and the Trinity to certain people in a, in a relative kind of way. The next thing you guys, we write here, you guys, is that, that they may know Jesus. Now, knowing about God and knowing God are one different thing, because a lot of people believe in God. The Jews believe in God. Muslims believe in God. Lots of people believe in God, but do they believe in Jesus? And not that he was a person, that he was a man. We all know that. But do they believe him as God? 
Now, this is an important thing. This is the difference between Christianity and every other philosophy or religion on the face of the planet is Jesus God, the deity of Jesus Christ. You will find that across the board, every other religion does not believe that Jesus is God. They'll say, God is God, but Jesus isn't God. He was a, a wise man. He was a prophet. He was a holy man. He was a good example. He was, you know, but they will never say that he's God. And that's the difference between us, meaning born-again believers, and the rest of the planet, and the rest of the world, is that Jesus is God. And so he says this in 1 John 2, 3, and I write to you, fathers, because you have known him, who is from the beginning. Now, we're going to go into, he doesn't say Jesus there. He says him who is from the beginning. We're going to prove that point later on as we get into the book of John chapter 1 and also this first chapter of 1 John. He who is from the beginning, the living word. And we're going to say that this is God himself. This is Jesus who had his hands in all things of creation. Sixth thing that I wrote down here is that because they have overcome the evil one. In 1 John 2, 13 and 14, I write to you young men because you have overcome the wicked one. I have written to you, young men, for you have overcome the wicked one. Both verses, he talks about them overcoming the wicked one. Does that mean just, just because you're young, you have a victory or power over the, young, uh, of, of the enemy? No. What he's literally saying is, you young men, as you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ, as you've given him over your life, and he's become your Lord, God, and Savior, now his redemptive blood has washed you and cleansed you, and now he has conquered sin, conquered death, and conquered hell, and those things no longer have power over your life anymore. So in essence, on this earth, while you're alive in Christ, you have power over Satan and over the, the, the dimensions of all evil. And it doesn't mean that we won't be tempted and tried and tested. It doesn't mean that evil things won't happen to us. But in the end, we conquer, we have a dominion over the devil and all of his forces because we are filled with the Spirit, and God is greater than the enemy in darkness. So just understand that. Then... The seventh thing I wrote down here, and this is, again, one of these things that says, he says, because they are strong, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you. How do we know that we have fellowship with God? Because you're walking in the strength of his spirit. And, and, and how are we walking? The word abiding. And this is going to come up in a minute because we're going to talk about this. The word abide literally means to live within the bounds. It's much like you have a house. And around your house, you have a fence. Now, the fence is there to keep the dog in the yard. It's also to keep other people from going into your yard and just hanging out in your backyard. It's a boundary that's set. Now, people ask me all the time, what is the boundary for my life? It, it can't be compared with anybody else's life. As a matter of fact, God has given each person, as they become a believer, a different measure of grace. And we need to be careful that we don't in, uh, intrude upon other people's grace, but grace is given to each person. Now, what the word abide literally means is that God has certain qualifications and certain things that we need to make sure that we are in fellowship and we are in, in tune with. And the word to abide literally means to live within the boundaries of his love and the commandments that he has set forth from us. Now, a lot of people see the word of God as being restricted, as being uh, something that is keeping them from having a good time. As a matter of fact, there was the exact same thing that Satan said to Eve. God does not want you to eat the fruit because he knows that the day you eat it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God. He lied to her. He didn't, they weren't going to be like God, meaning all-knowing, but he said you'll know the difference between evil and good and, and death and life. And that is true. But he only told her a certain part of it. Now, when we learn to abide in Christ, it's literally like finding a flow of, of a river and then jumping into that river. You don't want to swim against the current. It's, it's going to be lots of exercise, lots of work, and lots of toil, and it's going to tire you out. But if you find the flow of this river and jump in it, because that's the direction that God is moving, that's what it's called to abide. You want to go in the direction that God is leading. You want to go according to what He is saying in His Word for us to have a harmonious relationship with us and with Him. So that's what the word literally means, to abide. And we'll get into that in a little bit more detail as we go through this book. The eighth thing I wrote down is because they might have truth. Now, again, I said earlier that we live in an age where truth is all relative, meaning it's whatever you think it is. If one person believes one thing is true, it's okay. If another person thinks another thing is true, hey, that's what they believe. But we believe is the truth is, is absolute. It's not open to subjection. You can, but truth proves truth. 
truth is, I have a little saying, truth is, the truth is. God's word is truth. There is nothing in it from the beginning to the end that can be proven wrong. God's word backs up God's word, and so that every time you use God's word to, to explain to somebody the, the truths of God, there's always verse after verse after verse that backs up that point. Not taken out of context, but literally taken within a context, because we see that God is truth. His essence is truth. He cannot lie. It is against his nature to lie. And so everything he says to man, does for man, and does in front of man, is to further push that fact that he is a God of truth and there is no lie. There's no variance with God. And, and the fact that when we, as Christians, believe in God, he makes truth known to us uh, and, and, and reveals truth to us each and every day as we, as we get to know him more and more. The ninth thing is that because some would try to deceive them. He, he knows that in these last days, and again, talking about what we spoke to recently about the truth, because we live in an era that the truth is being challenged, he wants to make sure that you're not easily deceived. Uh, again, this whole teaching of the Gnosticism was one of the reasons why he wrote this book, to combat the lie. He doesn't want his children to be deceived. As a matter of fact, if you have children, you have brothers and sisters, cousins, whatever, would you want them to be deceived by somebody that's going to lead them in the wrong direction and, and possibly destroy them? No, you would not. That's not what love is. Because God is a loving Father, His desire for His children is that they would be led and directed in the right path, and they would be warned and prepared and equipped against those lies and the deceptions that come in through the enemy, through people, through circumstances, situations, false philosophies and ideas. And again, we'll get into that later. And the last thing he wrote down here, the last principle or the last thing that he wrote this book for was so that they would know that they have eternal life. If we didn't have eternal life, you guys, this would be a sad existence. If all we had was this earth, uh, I don't know about you, but I would be like, forget it. What, what, what good would there be for me to re refrain or re restrain myself from doing all the fun things in this world if there wasn't an afterlife that was better than this? If there wasn't something that was waiting for us? I love what Jesus said. He said, I go to prepare a place for you. And he said this to his disciples. So that where I am, you will be also. You've heard me say it before many times that in my father's house, he says, are many mansions. And if I would not have said that, I would not have said to you that I go to prepare a place for you. Jesus says it very, very plainly that there is a life and there is a destination and there is a dwelling for us outside of this eternity. The Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. In other words, we know that when we close our eyes and breathe our last here on this earth, we open it and automatically we're in the presence of God. And John tried to explain it in, in the book of Revelation. It says it was like a sin for him to try to explain it because there were not words, human words to express the things that he heard and the things that he saw. The eye has not seen or ear hath heard the things that God has prepared for those that love him. We know this in the word of God. We do not know or understand the kingdom to come, but we do know it is there. We do know it is eternal. We do know it is beautiful and filled with joy and peace. We have little portraits of it in the book of Revelation, but we have no idea what it is. We just know that it's a lot better than what we've got here now, and we know there is eternal life, meaning we have never understood the fact that we will never die. We will physically die. This body will put off, and then we'll take on a new body in heaven, but our spirit will never die again. You know, somebody, I, I think I, I've, I've read this before, that man is an eternal creature in the sense of our spirits live forever. Here's the difference. We don't uh, transcend into higher life forms, as many people believe. We don't reincarnate as different life forms, as some people believe. We, are not, we don't go into a better place, a holding place, based on the good things we have done on earth. As a matter of fact, the Bible says all of our works as human beings are as filthy rags. So there's nothing that we can do that would earn our position in heaven with God. There's only one thing that can be done here on earth that will ensure that, and that is our acceptance of the free gift that was offered to us by God through the life of His Son, Jesus, on the cross. If we receive that and believe that and apply that and walk in His ways and love Him and, and seek this whole life into pleasing Him, then we have eternal life through Him. It is a free gift of God. Our name is written in the book of life. The blood that he shed washes away our sins and we become, in essence, a brand new creature. His spirit now begins to dwell in your heart and that's what we call the regeneration process. He begins to change you day by day. Now, some people think, as soon as I got saved, I was a brand new believer. I've seen that happen. 
But the truth is it takes an entire lifetime to be transformed in the likeness of God all day long because he's chipping away. It's like a work of art. It just doesn't happen overnight. Picasso didn't wake up and go, bam, there's a masterpiece, you know. Renoir didn't just wake up one morning and throw some paint on a, on a, on a, on a piece of, 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 of canvas and say, there's a, a masterpiece. It took weeks, months, years for them to be able to think about what they're painting and thus put that perfect work on that canvas. Well, think about God. Sometimes he takes a little bit of time with people and sometimes he takes a lot of people, a lot of time with people. But God knows what he's doing. He is the master crafter. He is the master potter. And he knows exactly what he's doing. So throughout the entire course of our life, each and every day, he's molding us and shaping us more into his likeness. And that is the process of life. And that is actually the meaning of life. People want to know, what's the meaning of life? The meaning of life is that I might become more and more like my Lord, my God, and my Savior. Not, not that I might become God, but that I might be more Christ-like. I want to do, I want to say, I want to act, I want to be led by his spirit so that I can bring him glory and honor because he gave me eternal life. Let's get into the first four verses of this book. I love it. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. And then he says, and that life was manifested And we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that the eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us, that which we have seen and we have heard, which we have declared to you, that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. There's so much in those first four verses, but we talked about this in the very beginning. The purpose was to restore fellowship. And I like the fact that he starts off the first two verses in saying that he was literally an eyewitness. He says it, that which from the beginning, and this is the same thing he says in John chapter 1, in the beginning was the word, of, uh, was the word and the word was with God. Now, if you ever read the book of John and you look at this passage, the word, word is capitalized. And that's because it's a personal pronoun. He's talking about a person, not a thing. If it says, if the word was with God, and it was just a normal, regular word to be a small w. This one's capitalized. It's a personal pronoun, meaning he's speaking of this word being a person. He says, in the beginning was the word. And so the word, this person was in the very beginning. And so you're going to say, oh, okay, well, that, that, that word is probably God. Well, look what he says. And the word was with God. How could God be with God? Track with me here. Then he says, and God was, and, and he said he was with God, and the word was God. So we know that this beginning this word this person was in the very beginning in other words before everything was made he was with the father in the beginning and it also says that um that he was god himself who else do we know that was from the beginning that was with the father and is also god again part of the very uh, beginning of the of the uh the idea of the uh the trinity again jesus jesus was at the very beginning the word word literally means logos means god breathed forth and this is what he's talking about here And the word was God. And he was in the beginning with God. And all things were made through him. In other words, we see that he is also a creator. This is Jesus. And without him, nothing was made that was made. In him was life. In other words, without him, there was no life. Now you think about, I thought God was the giver of life. But remember, Jesus is God too. We know that man was just animated dust. In other words, we're made of 16 elements of dirt. But the Bible says that when God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, he became a living being. It says right here, in him, meaning in Jesus, was the life, and the life was the light or the consciousness of man. Without that breath of life, without that logos, that God-breathed inspiration, you and I would not be here. We would cease to become. And verse 5 is, and the light shined in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. It is that way to this day, isn't it? When people see light, the dark always flees away from the light. It's interesting, I use this illustration a lot, that if you were to take a, in a completely dark room and you were to light a match, you'd be able to see through the darkness. Well, if you had an entire room that was lit up and you opened up a, a canister that had darkness in it, would that darkness overshadow the light? No, it would not. The light would dissipate the darkness, but not the other way around because light is always better and, and more stronger 
uh, than darkness. And we see this here in the spiritual realm as well. And then from verses uh, 6 on, I'm sorry, go to uh, uh, back to 1 John. I like how he says this. He says, in the beginning. So that very first thing he's talking about in there is the beginning. He says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. He's literally talking about an eyewitness to Jesus himself. Again, that word of life. And that life was revealed or manifested, and we have seen and we bear witness and we declare to you that that eternal life which was with the Father was revealed or manifested to us. He says, I was there, I saw the whole thing. That same life that was with God from the very beginning was revealed to us, the disciples. That which we have seen and which we have heard, now we declare to you. He said, I want to share with you, he says, all the things that we heard, all the things that we saw concerning this this life, this, this, this eternal life. He says that you also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. There it is. Finally we have, and God, His, His purpose is fulfilled, is that that fellowship is literally fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. He became the one that bridged the gap, again, like I said earlier, between a lost man and and a loving father. And so now we have that oneness, that koinonia, not only with us and God again, but we have an also a different kind of fellowship now with other human beings because now they are filled with the Spirit and we are filled with the Spirit and it's God's Spirit. So now all of us become one family and one people under God. It's pretty awesome. And it has no difference. It doesn't matter what race or color or nationality. It's all about the Spirit of God. We all become one family in Jesus Christ. And I love that. And then he says right here in verse um, 4, he sums it up, those first four verses. And these things we write to you that your joy, in other words, your inward contentment would be full. And that's a beautiful thing. Now from verses 5 through 9, he's going to talk about, I'm sorry, 5 through 7, he's going to talk about walking in light. Now this is a a big thing. Maybe there's three things about God that we are going to see in the book of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. One of them is that God is light, okay? One of them is that God is light. The other one is that God is love. And the other one is that God is life. The three L's. We got life, or light, we got love, and we got life. Now in the first book, or the first chapter, first, uh, say First John all the way up to chapter 2 and 3, we're going to see that God is light. This is super important. In First John 1, 5 through 7, it says this, And this is the message which we have heard from him, and now we declare to you that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. As I told you earlier, light has power over darkness, and there is no variation. Now, God, he, he sheds his truth and his light throughout the whole world. And the, tr- the, the truth is that light reveals the darkness, not only in the world, but also in our own hearts, doesn't it? Most of the things that people do, they do in the darkness so that it won't be seen by God. The nighttime is the time when crime happens the most, basically from the time of about 9 o'clock at night to about 5 o'clock in the morning is when most crimes occur. And it's because people think that the darkness is going to hide them. But the truth is, the light of God and His truth always reveals the darkness. And this is what He's saying here. If we say that we have fellowship, I like this, He says, uh, I declare to you that God is light and in Him there is no darkness at all. In other words, no variance of darkness. Verse 6, if we say that we have fellowship with Him and we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Now He's talking about what are the proofs of our fellowship with God? Or what are some of the things that are going to deter that, re- that fellowship with God? One of them is our declaration that we have no sin. The Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But the truth is, not all people acknowledge their sin. They see that as just human nature. No, no humans are inerrantly evil, is what they say. But we all just, you know, make bad choices. That is true. We do make bad choices. We make a choice rather to obey God and to disobey God. To, uh, to uh, lay hold of the things of heaven or to allow those things of this world to drag us down to hell. It is a choice. I I agree with that fact, that it is definitely a choice. But the choice is yours, and God gives it to you alone. Do you want Him to set you free and to make you a brand new person, or do you want to continue to be dragged down by the cares of this life? That choice is each individual person to make. Here He says right here, If we say we have no fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. So it says, if we say that we don't have, we have, if we say that we're in fellowship with God, but yet our life uh, is different from what we profess. In other words, he's saying profession and practice need to be on the same page. You've heard the old expression, 
walk the walk and talk the talk. In other words, this is what he's saying. Our words and our actions have to match. Now, we're human and we're going to mess up sometimes. But that's where we have the grace of God and the mercy of God to cover us. But we don't make it a practice to constantly walk contrary to the things that we profess. Matter of fact, if we say we love God, then we should live a life that reflects that love. For instance, if you say, I love my mom and dad, but you're always doing things to upset them. You're always doing things that make them sad and grieve their spirit. Then your words, meaning I say I love my mom and dad, are not consistent by what you're doing. And so you actually have to be truthful and say, no, actually, I don't love my mom and dad because I say that I love them with my words, but all the things that I do and I scheme and I plan in my heart are evil, wicked things, and I know they're going to make them sad and grieve them. So no, I really don't love them. Then who do you love? If you say that you love someone, but you're doing the opposite, you really love yourself, you really love your flesh, you really love the things of this world, and in essence, Hate to say this, but it's true. You love Satan more than you love God because the things that you're doing are the things that he wants you to do instead of the things that God wants you to do. And that's just a profound truth. You can see that in our practices all the time. Jesus said, you're either for me or you're against me. He doesn't leave any wiggle room in between. For me or against me. He says, for me or you're half and half. He doesn't say that. He says, you're either for me or you're against me. He literally says that. If you were lukewarm, I'd spit you out. I'd rather have you hot or cold. But if you're in the middle... I'll vomit you out of my mouth. He says, I would rather have you one or the other. And a lot of people live their lives that way, right smack down the middle, never being on one side or the other. So he says in verse 7, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And listen, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Now this is a great promise here. Here's what it literally says. If we do have fellowship with God and we're walking in obedience, We have the assurance that his blood washes us and cleanses us from every sin. There is not a sin, there's not a habit, there's not a thing in this world that God will not forgive save one. The Bible says there is only one sin that God will not forgive, and that is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is the only sin. What is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? It's kind of a big word. The word blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is a continual rejection of the love of God as manifested through his free gift of salvation through his son. In other words, you reject Jesus, you reject God's love, and if you do that all the way until the time you die, you have committed the unpardonable sin and you will go straight to hell. That's not a fear thing. That's not a, you know, a threatening thing. That's not a, a, an evil dream thing. This is the truth. That's what God's word says. To reject Christ and to reject his salvation to reject his spirit moving and working and transforming in your life, you are actually saying, I don't believe, and thus you will die in unbelief, much like the children of Israel. And your name will not be written in the book of life. It is the only sin, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, that will not be forgiven man. Jesus said that in his own words. Now from verses 8 on through verse 10, we have the confession of sins, the power of confession. Now, some sins are confessed before man, and some sins are confessed before God. God is the first and foremost person you should confess to when you fall into sin. He says, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Now, this is talking about a person who says, no, I'm good. And you hear people say that all the time. I don't need church. I don't need a relationship. I don't need a religion because I'm a good person, and I think that in the end, God's going to see me, and uh, it's all going to be good. And you hear people uh, make these, these crazy claims based on their own righteousness, of what they believe righteousness is. Well, we heard me say it earlier. Righteousness is not what you think of yourself. Righteousness is not other, even what other people think you are. The word righteous means to be in a right standing with God. And the only way that you and I could be in a right standing with God is if we stand before him covered with the blood of Jesus Christ. That's where we get the word justification. When we were watching, if you read, if you read the book of Romans, he talks about this, that justification is the process by which God literally makes us acceptable in the eyes of God, through his son, Jesus Christ. In other words, by when we come to Christ, we confess our sins, we receive him as our personal and savior, his blood washes us and cleanses us. And so God now sees us with the same righteousness that he sees his own son. And he sees us just as if we've never sinned, just if I, just as if I'd never sinned. And that's what the word justified means. That's what the word righteousness means. Not according to my good deeds or my own personal human righteousness, but according to the righteousness of God, through the blood of Jesus Christ, I'm accepted in the Lord. And this is what he's talking about in verse 8. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not really in us. 
But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us for our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Verse 9, I could live in this verse right here. Look at what he says. If we confess our sins, in other words, if we're honest with God and with ourselves, if we're honest with God and ourselves and we confess, hey, I'm a sinner. I got issues. I got problems. And God, I need your help to help me get through these things and overcome these things. Then it says he is faithful and, the, and also says, and he is just. The word just means he's righteous in his judgment. And he will forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Notice the inclusion there. He washes us and cleanses us from all sin. I love this, you guys. In this first chapter, we see that fellowship with God is completely possible. Not only is it possible, it's provided for us, and the pathway is Jesus. So my question to you is, do you want fellowship with God? Do you want to restore your life back to the relationship that God had from the very beginning? Have your name written in the book of life? Have your sins put away and washed away and have a brand new character and a brand new nature? My friends, the solution is, Give your life to Jesus. Walk with Jesus Christ and allow him to do a brand new work in your life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time, Lord, and thank you for this opportunity that we have to go through this amazing book. And Lord, I pray through the course of this book that our fellowship with you would grow deeper and deeper and stronger and stronger and that we'd fall more and more in love with you and that you would transform our lives more into your likeness and use us for your glory. Lord, we lift these things before you and ask that you would have your will and your way. In Jesus' name we pray and everyone said, amen. God bless you guys. Thanks for tuning in and we'll see you next week. Have a great night.